Welcome to another live Wednesday night edition here on the Rock Pile, and the legends continue here tonight. And I was talking to Coach here before we went on live, and I said, forget football, basketball, and baseball. Let's talk some field hockey tonight. But before all my shows, I want to make sure I thank uh, the Rome Sports Hall of Fame for helping me sponsor all the legend shows here. This is the first episode. This is number five, but the first one of the month of March. Um, next week, I'll have my Uncle Paul 80 on. I'll have Jimmy Kenny on. I'll have Coach Fleet. And I'll end the end of this month with Coach Jerry Fiorini. If you want to sponsor any of the Rock Pile shows, just shoot me a message on Facebook, uh, YouTube, or any of my social media posts. You can follow the show live on any of them. If you are going to put some comments or questions into the broadcast tonight, if you have any questions for Coach or comments, put them in there. I'll try to bring over as many as I can. It's always nice to see some former players and coaches put some comments and posts on here tonight. So I appreciate that. So without further ado, let's see if I can get Coach Harjung on here with me tonight. She'll be on here in just a second. Let me get her off mute. And now I think we can say we are officially live. Coach, how are you tonight? I'm great. How are you doing, Rack? I'm doing good. It's always nice to get the coaches on, but I think when you come on before we go live, you get those sidebar conversations, and I think you probably <laughs> stole 10 minutes of my material tonight. So Sorry about that. <laughs> but, uh, but that's okay. But, Coach, as I just said, forget football, basketball, and baseball. we got to bring some field hockey on. And when you think field hockey here in Rome, you your name is the only name that comes up. Um, but before we do any of that, I want you to take us through your high school because I didn't know you, you were a multi-sport athlete. Yep. Uh, not like it is today, but uh, when I went to, New I was actually born in Rome, um, but my family moved when I was two and I went to New Hartford Central School and we always played against Rome. So it's just kind of ironic the way things come around. Um, but I played everything. We were four sport athletes. I played field hockey in the fall, basketball, volleyball, and softball. And field hockey is the sport I always loved, but softball was probably the one I was best at. And coach, I was telling you before, I had to do some research like I do on all these shows. And I think I know a lot of the coaches, but when you hear a lot of the past stories and, and the history behind a lot of this, I, I the one most intriguing thing I heard was you got cut from a sport. Talk to us about that. Well, you know, for all those kids out there that, uh, that think they're, all that in sports, let me tell you, and I was one of them in high school. I was one of the best athletes in high school. I wasn't outstanding, but I was probably above average. I went to Cortland and all of a sudden I was on the bottom, I was in the bottom of the barrel again and starting all over. And I just, I didn't realize at the time and I didn't do the work. And I got cut not only from varsity, but I got cut from JV. It was devastating absolutely devastating. I'd never been cut from a team in my life. And coach, you bring up a good point and I'll probably jump around numerous times tonight, but you bring up the point of, you know, the multi, the three sport athlete, you know, nowadays is, is pretty much gone. Years ago, you saw yep. a lot more three sport athletes. When you think of that now from what it was years ago, and we had those types of athletes, what's changed? Well, you know, the state came out and changed the rule about practicing off season. Um, I think it was probably because they they couldn't control it. They couldn't police it. Uh, and a lot of schools were starting to do that and kind of get in the way with it. And they would play year round with these kids. And that wasn't the, the premise behind it was you have your fall season. When you're done with your fall season, you stop and you move on and let the kids enjoy another sport. And that's what it used to be. And, and honestly, I really liked it like that because I would not have had the opportunities that I've had if it was only one sport. And like we just said, if I only, you know, if I was only going to play field hockey and then I got cut, my whole dream, everything is gone. And then what am I going to do? So I, I think cross training is absolutely imperative for all athletes. I don't care what sport you play. I don't care if it's in peewees and youth and coming up through high school, college. I, I think you need to, you need to cross train. You need to be involved in a lot of different athletic opportunities. Coach, do you think, you know, years ago it was always, you were so proud to wear, you know, the name, you know, RFA on your jersey, whether it was the front or the back. But, you know, now I feel like with field hockey and some other of the sports, you have AAU and basketball. These kids can play basketball all year round. 
you know, in the wintertime, there's indoor field hockey. There's all these different travel um, leagues you can play on. Do you think that takes away from the three-sport athlete now that you can focus primarily on one sport all year round? Um, I, yeah, I do. I think it takes away a little bit because, you know, when I was coaching, you'd have kids who were on your team during the season, but, you know, let's say they were playing field hockey, but they're already playing for basketball with AAU and they get hurt in the basketball tournament and now they can't play for you either. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that did make a big difference. And I, I think that just goes right back to kids being allowed to, you know, or trying to narrow down to one sport, they're really trying to be competitive in that sport. So they'll do anything and they'll play all year round, but they still want to be a part of other teams. And I, I just think that's got a lot to do with it. Yeah. And I think it's so hard when you mentioned that, you know, you were a great athlete in high school and, you know, you said you didn't put the time in, but when you got to the college, you know, whether it's division three, division two, II, division one, I, I always say this on this show and my Saturday morning show, and I'm not knocking any of the athletes that have come from this area, but you know, even to play a Division three sport, the commitment, you have to be really committed. You have to be really good because it takes a special athlete to play at any of those levels, right? Yep. Yep, absolutely it does. Division three, I think, is even more so because you don't, you're not guaranteed. You don't have the scholarships. So you really have to show what you have, and you're on the spot every single day. You know, I mean, Division one and two, you are as well, but they at least got to see you play and pick you. But then you've got to maintain. If you're not winning or you're not performing, you could lose your scholarship. And, Coach, we'll get into some of your, your teams and all that. But, you know, one of the things I remember you said a long time ago, and I was reading a lot of past articles on you, is, you know, like my junior year team that went to the state championship, a lot of the good teams I played on, not only in high school but in college, we lived it. So when the yep. season was over, we were in the gym, we were we were working out, we were running – you know, do you still see a lot of that nowadays from from a lot of these athletes putting in that type of a time? No, I don't. I don't. Um, and I think early on, a lot of my teams were like that. I mean, they lived, breathed and ate field hockey. They couldn't get enough of it. And when the season ended, all they wanted to know was when's winter start? Mm -hmm. You know, when can we when can, when can we start playing indoor? When can we do this? And I I, I think it it happens to with some kids, but not all of them. It's not the majority, I don't think. And coach, let's go back to again. I want to go back to your playing days. So you get cut from Cortland State. Where did the coaching come from? When did you say, you know what? I think I'm going to be a coach. How did that well, happen? Well, when I got cut, um, about a week and a half later, the coach contacted me and three other athletes and said that, um, that it was the JV coach. And uh, four of the girls that they had picked for the team decided they didn't want to play. After all the tryouts were done, and I can't remember if the season had started, I think it had, um, and they probably weren't playing a whole lot, so they decided they didn't want to play. And she said, I, I need more bodies, and there's no guarantee, and I, you know, I couldn't get there fast enough. I just wanted to play. So I did play my JV year, well, I, I was on the team my JV year. I didn't play a whole lot. And so then I, the following year, I decided, okay, you either do the work and make the team and leave no doubt, or you don't. And so I did the work. I trained in the off season and I went back to tryouts and I was there for like three days. And I felt, I honestly felt like I was going to make varsity that year. I thought I was doing really well. And I just, I turned around and I went and I talked to the coach and, you know, I wanted to know what she thought, if she thought I was going to make the team. And she said, yes, that you will make the team. And I just kind of went back to my dorm that night and thought about it. And I'm like, you know what, do I, is this really what I want to do? And I went back and talked to her again before she made the final selections. And she asked me about a manager position. And I was like, well, I don't know what's a manager do kind of thing. So, but let me tell you, if you ever have an opportunity to be a manager of a college team, you have to do it because you're in charge of all the money. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. You know, every trip that we took and there were a lot of long, long bus rides, you're in charge of all the meals, so all the meal plans and organizing all that. And, and I ended up uh, coaching goalkeepers for three years until I, until I left Portland. So that's, 
kind of where my coaching experience came from. And how did you arrive at RFA, Coach? What brought you to uh, to Rome? Well, um, the the short story is I had a terrible student teaching experience uh, when I was at Cortland trying to finish up, and I decided I wanted nothing to do with teaching. So I worked a couple of other jobs before then. Uh, one was with the Herkimer County ARC, working with some okay. community-based adults in a rec program. And I also worked at the House of Good Shepherd for a year working with autistic kids. And I decided after three years, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to lose my degree here. i got to get my master's or I've got to make a decision. So I decided to give it a try. And I ended up going to Sequoia Elementary School. Um, the lady that was there, that teacher was on a maternity leave. So they had an opening. She was supposed to be there for two years. She came back a year early, but um, I took that position at Sequoia Elementary and ended up actually teaching a couple of my cousins, which was kind of fun because um, we still talk about that to this day. And it was a wonderful experience. I didn't want to leave. They didn't want me to leave. And then the teacher came back a year early. So I had to leave. And the only job out there was a part time position at Whitesboro at Hartsill School. So I ended up there and all along I was coaching at both of those districts. And I went to a job fair and interviewed with none other than Fran Lazeski. Okay. And uh, um, I did. he gave me the application and I didn't apply because I wasn't sure if I was qualified because I was nervous about taking a full-time position. And he called me three days later and said, uh, it would be to your benefit to apply, fill out the paperwork. And, you know, so I did and I interviewed and I was offered the job on the spot. They needed a field hockey coach. That was a, a huge push behind it, I think. Um, and there I am, 29 coach, years later. And coach, obviously we were talking before we came on how field hockey has has definitely changed. And I said 20 years and you said it goes longer than that. The sticks were different. You said they rolled the ball out yep. um, at times. But I want to ask you about the athletes first because you've coached a lot of good athletes um, you coached a lot of good teams, and we'll get into some of those teams. Um, but as far as the athlete goes, from day one, you got um, your head coaching job at RFA. How much has the athlete changed? Well, the I started – I was very fortunate. I was very blessed. I've been blessed all along the way with outstanding athletes on pretty much every team that I've ever coached in Rome. Um, I, you know, two of my first athletes were Amanda Travis and Melissa D'Antonio. Yep. And they both went on to play at D1 schools, you know, and uh, that was all new to me, though. So I was just kind of getting my feet wet. And I learned a lot from them along the way as well. And, uh, you know, when you just you, you just kind of look at the athlete from season to season we, had, we were at Pinty Field at that time. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. the field over there. It was terrible grass field. Um, we had all kinds of issues there. But when the turf field came on, all of a sudden we started attracting all these really good athletes. You know, they say success breeds success. You start doing well. You start winning some games. And you start getting noticed a little bit. And you, it draws in more of the better athletes, I think. Um, and it did for a long, long time, pretty much most of my career. But as far as the dedication of the athletes, I think it's hit and miss. You have those kids that will live, breathe, and eat that sport, and they'll do anything they can to get on the field. And you have others that are okay, and they're comfortable with just being a part of that team. They just want to play once in a while. You know, and it's just it's different, and every team is very different. Coach, you didn't lose too many games. You won you won three hundred and fifty two games. Um, and you <laughs> I think I got that number right. Three hundred and fifty two wins, one hundred and forty one losses, and sixty one ties. But from your earlier years coaching at Rome, what were some of the lessons you learned that you know as you got older and you know you spent more time um, obviously coaching? What were some of the early lessons you learned? Well, I was out coached what I believe was one time in my career. And I, I promised that that would never, ever happen again. And it was in a regional game. Actually, it was a, it was a state game. And it was against um, 
Was it Lancaster? No. Now I can't remember what school. I think it was Lancaster from section five or six. And um, you just, you know, and the whole thing with, uh, oh, regionals, that's what it was. It was on our own field. It was regionals. And I had a girl wearing a barrette and somebody during the game, we scored a goal, but a player on the other team got a scratch on her face. And so at halftime, we didn't know anything about it because I didn't know that the girl even had a barrette in and, you know, the jewelry rule at the time. And we came back out on the field and then they protested on the spot because the girl that scored was the one that had the barrette in. Oh. So they took the goal away after about an hour of standing outside in 30 degree temp temperatures. They took the goal away, you know, and um, that <laughs> um, so we had to we had to score again and we did almost immediately. But uh, it's some of the things like that you just. You, you don't want to get out coached. Little things like that, like a barrette. Little things like in one of our games at the state level, they had a player off the field, just hanging out off the field, right outside of where the circle is and the goalie. And the other team had very few breakaways, but they got a breakaway and they just hit the ball upfield. And nobody's down there but my goalie. Everybody else had pushed up above the 50. And a girl came flying over the sideline from the other team picked up the ball and scored against my goalie. And we're all looking around like, what happened? Where'd she come from? Well, it was a strategy from the coach. And they not only did it once in the game, they scored again doing the exact oh, same wow. thing. And we won that game three to two. But still, it's just, it's incredible some of the things that you learn along the way. But, you know, we do, I'm sure you know, because your sister played. So she's probably stolen a few of my, my coaching strategies, I would imagine. I know she does quotes all the time. I was big on quotes, um, journal writing, playbooks, things like that. Um, you know, tiger pills, make them mean and hungry so they want to score. Lots of fun things, you know. Coach, she did say, because I called her last night and I said, Shan, I said, I got a bunch of stuff on Coach Harjung, but is there some stuff – and, of course, she mentioned the quote thing with you, but she also mentioned, I don't know if it was a pregame thing where you handed out whether it was index cards that had a letter on it or a, or a word, and they had to use the word in a sentence. But my now you're giving away my secrets. <laughs> but my sister said, she goes, I used a lot of Coach Harjung's talks and her notes and just, you know, little team building things. Um, but talk to us about some of those. Those are the neat things. I like those. Well, and it was um, it was something that I only did in postseason, and I I can't I can't claim that those were all my ideas. I got a lot of that from my mentor Jackie Tompkins at New Hartford High School. That's who I played for, and she did a lot of those things. And then I added some more. But the thing with the three by five cards, every athlete would get a card with a word on the outside, and in each game it was a different card. And then I would flip it over. I spent, <laughs> I can't tell you how many hours and hours upon hours looking up different words, using a thesaurus, using a dictionary, words that I had never heard of even. So I had to write down definitions. I don't know if the kids really knew that because <laughs> they would come to me, they'd turn their card over and we would take turns and they'd have to read what the word was and then define what it meant to them for that game. You know, and kids would come up to myself and, Coach Ringland at the time, and ask us, Coach, what does this word mean? And I'd have to refer back to my notes for some of them because I wasn't really sure the definition. Because you know, the further you go, the more words I have to come up with, and you try to make it specific to that player. You know, um, that was just just some of the fun things. But we used to do hit the dirt. That was before I got to Rome. That was a tr no, it wasn't. That came from my high school. Everything gets mixed together. Um, hit the dirt. You just at any time during practice, hopefully at a safe time when the kids aren't hitting the ball around, um, you yell hit the dirt and the last one down has to jog a lap, um, you know, just to kind of keep them on their toes and keep them moving. We did playbooks. Like I said, we did journal writing. Um, the tiger pills were at halftime to make them mean and hungry, supposedly. Um, you know, just a lot of little things like that. And and those are the things I think that stuck with the kids because they were very meaningful. They looked forward to postseason. 
because they knew they were going to get this card. Oh, I wonder what that's going to be now. And, and at the banquet, I would always give them all of the awards and all the cards and things that, uh, that, uh, you know, they've gotten during postseason. So just keep it fun. Now, Coach, I know all coaches have their pregame rituals. You know, I, I used to have my own rituals, too, and um, superstitions. Did you have any? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I had my lucky coin. They all had to touch the lucky coin before we did our cheer, team cheer to go out on the field. Uh, you had to wear, you know, for a long time, you know, I had to wear the same shirt or my assistant and I had to wear certain colors or something, you know, it just, when the kids started not washing socks and shin guards, that got me a little nervous. <laughs> and coach, how about, so you spent 30, is it 31 seasons? Yes. All together. 29 in Rome. 29 in Rome. So I'm, if I'm looking at my stats, nine league titles, seven regional titles, four state appearances, and you had the one state championship uh, in 1994. Um, right. but when you look back on all that, when did, cause I remember when I was, when I was playing and I was at RFA teams used to be so scared to come to Rome and play us in any sport. And it's like, you kind of started this little dynasty where teams were so scared to come and play RFA field hockey. When do you think RFA field hockey kind of got on the map? Well, I think it was because we ended up with that artificial turf field. Uh, you know, 93 was when the, that field was done, I believe, the first time. And 94 was when we won. Um, and I, because we, that artificial turf, our passing game just took off. And I think that's what really, really made a huge difference. You had other teams that had to practice in parking lots to get ready to play us. So I, I really think it was around that time. Um, and that was, but that was early you know, in my career. And I, people are asking me they're what are you, you going to do now? You just won a state championship. And I'm like, uh, win another, I don't know. What, what do you, how do you respond to something like that? You know, folks wanted me to go on to coach in college and I'm like, no, I really like the high school setting. I just like the kids. And I like, you know, I have very supportive parents and supportive community and it just kind of took off. So how about coach you win when you win the state championship was was life different after that for for you as a coach was there more pressure on you being that you just come off a state championship the expectations of Rome are always high Yeah it uh <laughs> well the expectations uh really put a lot of pressure on us to continue to do well and that you know that that definitely affects the way you coach and and I kind of changed the way that I was coaching at that point where um you know, I started instead of having a set, everybody has their own methods, and their own coaching philosophies. When I would coach and, and some people would get really mad at me that I do this, especially the players um, and others liked it. But I didn't go into any season after that saying, OK, we're going to play this system. We're going to play a three, 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 one or we're going to play a four, two or we're going to do whatever. Um, I waited till the season started and I looked to see what I had in the players that I had and then determined the system from there. And it might've taken a couple games to kind of get our feet wet a little bit. And, um, you know, and then we would just play a whole bunch of different systems. I mean, my kids were playing two and three systems in a season. It just depended on the situation and just depended on uh, what the weather had a lot to do with it, whether we were on grass, whether we were on turf, those were some challenges because most of the teams we were playing, even after the turf field started coming to some of the high schools, most of our games were still on, on grass when we played away. And that was a tough adjustment. My kids were spoiled, spoiled rotten, and they knew it. They hated playing on grass and teams used that to their advantage. Yeah. And, it, and it's funny how you think now, when you look across all the high schools, just about every oh, high yeah. school now has got the turf field. And, you know, we were the first, you know, school to have that turf. I mean, we were, I always say that all the sports back in the day, we were like a college program um, from whether it was uniforms, whether it was pre, you know, the, the warm up suits that, that we had there. I mean, every sport I think was just like a college team. Right. Right. Yep. Which I, I thought think we was, had, go ahead. 
No, which I was going to say, you know, nowadays, again, when you look at a lot of the programs to see where we were years ago to where it is now, it's like I feel like we were one of the first schools to really set the bar with athletics then. I, I believe so. I was just going to say I, uh, I've i been doing a lot of records research for the Hall of Fame recently, and those years in there when we won the state championship, we had a lot of really successful programs right across the board, girls teams and boys teams. There were there were several years there. There was a whole stretch where there was a lot of success. Coach, you got win number 300 in 2009. You beat Weedsport. How, <laughs> how special of a night was that for you? Uh, it was pretty special, um, especially since it was my good, it was against my good friend, Teresa Leonardi. Um, and we, uh, the, the 300th win, you know, I, I don't really keep track of that stuff in my head. I'm not thinking about that all the time, which is a good thing. You know, wins and losses, they come and they go. Yes, I'm proud of it, but, you know, it's all about the kids. It's all about the kids. And I think they knew it and they were trying to do that. You know, we had some real dedicated kids. They're like, coach, we're going to get this for you. So it was pretty, it was pretty awesome. So I know most coaches, you always remember the wins, but we, of course, you always remember some of those tough losses. Is there one of those those games, coach, that stands out to you the most that you say, ah, oh, boy, that one really hurt? There's a few. <laughs> There's a few. Anytime we lost to Liverpool, though, that was just, that was our big rival. That was the team that we wanted to beat all the time. And every time we lost it, we would be ahead and they would come back at the last minute and just pop one or two in and always catching us off guard. So that was, you know, you just have your rival schools, but I, I couldn't name one loss more than any other. Uh, other, well, other than I, I shouldn't say that that was the year that we lost five to nothing in the state final against, uh, I believe it was John Jay. We, uh, we won three nothing in the semi, and then we got to the final, and we just got our clocks cleaned. It was it was pretty bad. We were we were wondering if we could get some more, buy some more timeouts just to let <laughs> the kids breathe. And you know, when they catch off guard like that, it was it was tough. It was a really good team. Coach, how about your your best? Because I always say, you know, sometimes your best coaching job is not like you win a state championship. You you can you know, 20, whatever, and oh, you went, was it 22, 23, no? Yeah, 23. But I think sometimes, like, if I look back on my career, I think one of the years coaching, I think I went three and five, but I feel that was the best coaching job I did because we were faced with so much adversity at the end yep. of the prior year, and it's yep. like, eh, we, our kids fought like hell to, to win three games. Is, is it a certain season for you in, in 31 years that you say, you know what, I think that might have been my best coaching job? Uh, honestly, um, there were, there were a few, there were a few, I, my biggest, you know, it's again, it's not the win loss record, but it's the life lessons and the kids that the kids that come back. And, and I was thinking about this earlier today with all the kids that have played former players that became coaches. That to me is everything, you know, because they love the sport that much. And they learned enough that they wanted to coach, you know, for whatever reason. And I think I've had a lot of kids that have gone on to the coaching arena, which is awesome. But as far as a specific game, uh, not really. I couldn't name one. And coach, when you when you finally you had the, your last game, and I think you retired, was it 2016? Uh, I think it was 15. Yeah, 15, 16. Yeah, something like okay. that. So I, I've asked all the coaches so far on, on this show the same question I'll ask you. How did you know when it was time? Because even as athletes, you see these NFL guys that are still playing, and a lot of the coaches say, you just, you just know it's time. How did you know it was time? Well, there's a couple, there was a couple things to think about in there. I had been involved with the Section 3 field hockey for 20 plus – I was 20 years doing that as well. And I kind of, I knew I was coming up on retirement and I'm like, okay, what do I want to do? And everybody was telling me, well, but if you love coaching, just stick with it. You could still do that after you retire from teaching. And the more I thought about it, I'm like, 
I don't, I don't want to retire and then be, have to be committed to going back to work in the middle of the afternoon because I don't know what I'm going to do when I'm retired. I didn't really have a plan. I was just going to kind of play it by ear. And I just thought, you know what? I want to, I want to end my career on my terms. I want to leave on a high, not on a low. And I feel like that's what I did, you know? And it's, it's hard. It was hard. But once I had made that decision, I was like, okay, you know, cause you always had kids coming up to you saying, coach, one more year, one more year. You got to wait till I graduate. You got to wait for me, yeah. you know, and, and there's always going to be somebody that says that to you. So you just, you just have to think about what you want to do and, and make the decision. It's does not it get, knowing that's the hardest. Does it get any easier for you as years go on here? Another field hockey season comes and goes. Do you still get that same, <laughs> same feeling inside? Does it get any easier? Um, not really. No. And it's very different now, not coaching them and standing on the sideline and seeing things and wanting to coach them and knowing that you have to not say anything. You know, um, I miss the kids terribly, the interaction day to day with them. Um, you know, I had a lot of, like I said before, very supportive parents and, you know, it's like you just, but the kids, that's the big thing. That's the big thing. I, I miss the game. You know, I was doing a lot, not only coaching, but I was doing the section three stuff. I was on the state committee, um, doing a lot, going to clinics and stuff. And then, so I kind of started to discontinue those things a little at a time so that it wouldn't be, I knew I couldn't go cold Turkey with everything. So it was a little bit at a time. And I think it helped ease the transition a little bit. But now I'm so busy in retirement. <laughs> I, I don't have time for any of that. No, I still watch it. I still go watch it play. I watch the Olympics. I watch different things, but I don't worry about not getting back there right now. Coach, when you when you see the coaching now, and I and I still look at this now, and it seems like even when coaches win games, it's never enough. When you lose games, it's of course it's never enough. You think right. coaching's gotten harder over the years, or is the? I know the parents are always tough, right? The parents are brutal yeah. nowadays, but has it gotten tougher? Well, you know, years ago when I first started, the parents really didn't know too much about field hockey. And I kind of liked that. It wasn't like coaching basketball where everybody was in the gym and everybody knew basketball because you, you grew up playing it. Mm -hmm. So everybody knew the rules and everything. When I first started out pretty much the first half of my career, they didn't, not a lot of people knew what field hockey was all about. They, you know, what are all those whistles? Hey, you just got the ball and there's a whistle for this and a whistle for that. So they didn't really enjoy watching it as much as they did other sports, but I think it kind of caught on the craze a little bit, you know, and uh, people started to enjoy it. But I think it's it's definitely gotten harder. Uh, by one respect is that the teams that are out there now, there's a lot of turf fields. There's a lot of um, even though there's a lot of teams that need coaches. There's a lot of really good coaches out there as well that have that desire to, you know, be really good, especially like section four teams. They're incredible. You know, I learned a lot from those coaches. A lot of them are, are friends of mine um, working with them on the state committee and they just do an outstanding job. So you, you want to stay competitive. You got to do the work, not just as a player, but as a coach. Coach, I talked to a lot of your past players, and a lot of them say, you know, you were tough, hard-nosed, but very structured, uh, good teacher, uh, student of the game. How would you describe your style as, as a coach? Uh, well, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I feel like I was a student of the game, definitely. I constantly went to coaching clinics. I would talk to people all the time. You can ask uh, Mackenzie Welter now how many how many uh, boxes and totes full of coaching things I gave her when I was cleaning out. I would call her and she's like, "Coach, I don't have any more room in my house. Stop giving me things." And I'm like, "Well, if you give them to anybody, just give them to another coach. Do something." I think you um, 
you know, I bought DVDs all the time. I'd buy three or four at the beginning of a season because I knew that there were certain aspects of the game that I really needed to work on as a coach. So I would try to do that in the off season and, and try to work that into our indoor play and indoor skills and drills and get them ready to go outside. Um, I, I had a plan, you know, I wrote up a lesson plan every day. I had everything typed up and if I didn't get to drills, that was okay. We just moved them to the next day, but I always went in with a plan and tried to reflect that, you know, with the kids. So, and I, and I did that with my teaching. That's just kind of the way I am. Coach, I always say it's really tough to follow in the footsteps of a hall of fame coach um, in any, <laughs> in any sport. Right. Um, what advice when, when Mackenzie got the head job and took over for you, what were some words of wisdom? What were some advice you gave her? Because obviously filling in for you is a tough shoe to, to fit and you'll not, nobody will ever be able to do what you did, but what were some words of advice you gave her? Well, you know what, um, Rocky, someday somebody will, uh, do what I did and then some, and there's always somebody out there who's better. And one of the things that I just said to Mackenzie and, um, you know, she used to, she used to call me all the time and she would ask me a question, well, what would you do if you were doing this? Or what would you do if you were doing that? You know, and I would give her a little bit of advice and she goes, oh, okay, that's interesting. You know, so we still kind of do that interaction, but never stop learning. You have to, as a coach, you have to work year round. And unfortunately that's what it's gotten to, but to stay competitive, you have to do that. And I don't think I told her, I, you know, that it's not about what I did. It's about what you're going to do. And change is good. Change is good. You know, some of the kids might not like it in the beginning, but you have to develop your own style. It's what I used to tell players all the time. When you go to a camp, the more coaches you're exposed to, the better and more rounded Absolutely. player you're going to be. Because everybody's got a different way of approaching things. And I might tell you something 10 times and you still don't understand, but you go to someone else and they explain it. Oh, that's what you meant. You know, so it's, I think it's important. I think as a coach, you need to do that too. Coach, who are some people that's played an important part in your life um, as a coach? You know, some of the inspirational people that have helped you in your journey throughout your career. Well, like I mentioned in the beginning, Jackie Tompkins was definitely my mentor. Um, she, I actually coached with her a little bit. I did. Um, I had the JV team at New Hartford when I got out of college, and then she ended up. Um, she couldn't finish the season. She had to have a surgery, and I would. I took over for a couple of weeks at the end of the season. They were in the playoffs, and I would go to the hospital every day to get her notes and try to, you know, to get her what she wanted me to do with practice and who she wanted me to work with and that kind of thing. Um, so that was huge. Um, that's where I first kind of developed that, that love for the game other than playing. Um, Kathy Faber from Little Falls spent a lot of time with her through the section committee and on the state committee. Um, you know, my mom, which I mentioned before, uh, she used to, there were, I grew up, I was one of five. And she used to go to every four out of the five of us were athletes and she used to go to every single event, but especially for my sister and I, my sister was a track was in track. She used to go all the time, but she used to say to me, it's hard to watch track because they're moving around so much and <laughs> the events are so spread out. She goes, I like going here because I can actually like watch the whole game kind of thing. So I miss that. And coach, we were talking prior prior to coming on here the the lack of female coaches um, in all sports, right? I mean, I was just talking about basketball, but you can take any sport, and there's really a lack of. Mm -hmm. So, what's your take on the lack of females coaches in sports? Well, I, even in Rome, if you take a look at Rome, it's uh, most of the female sports are coached by male coaches, you know, and um, I, the personal feeling is, you know, not everybody likes to have a, a strong willed, confident woman. Um, they don't always, they don't always take that. It's okay for a guy to be like that, but it's not okay for a woman to be like that. And I think a lot of people have a hard time with it. And 
I think that there's a lot of women that don't want to coach because of, of some of the, you know, some of the grief that they take through different avenues, you know, like an upset player or an upset parent. And there's not everybody is cut out to deal with that stuff. We don't like it. That's for sure. Um, but I think there's a, a lack of coaches, lack of women that want to coach. So now somebody has to step in and a lot of the men are coaching the girls sports and the girls sports are a little bit more laid back, I think, than, mm -hmm. than coaching the male sports. Um, my, uh, my colleagues will probably yell at me for saying that, but uh, I think some of them are a little bit more laid back. It's a little more relaxing when you coach the girls sports, but you got to worry about, you know, supervision and things like that, you know, that, that are very different from the boys, you know, girl, boys get in a fight, they duke it out and they're over it. Girls, they get in a fight, they hold the grudge forever. <laughs> so it's, you have to be the kind of personality to be able to deal with those kinds of things too. Coach, how did you, how did your philosophy or how did you change as a coach throughout the years from when you first started till, you know, when you retired in 2016, what changed? For me as a coach, um, you know, uh, I've changed the way that I think I've changed the way that I've approached kids. Um, you know, I, I ended up doing, I didn't start out doing this, but I ended up as my career progressed, I would spend a lot more one-on-one -on -one time with kids. I would bring them in and talk to them in the office at the school and, you know, what, how are your grades? What, what do you need help with? You know, what, this is what I see you doing really well. This is what I think you need to work on. And it's hard to put that kind of time into every single one of your athletes, but it's necessary. You have to do that because kids need feedback. They need that feedback. I think one of the worst, the worst ways that I was when I first started is the best athletes. I always thought were the ones that really didn't need a lot of coaching. You just assumed they knew what to do. And I learned along the way, it's those are the kids that really, they need just as much feedback as anybody else because they need to know that what they're doing is what you want them to do and that they're doing it correctly. And that I learned the hard way. <laughs> and coach, you've had so many memorable moments um, throughout your coaching career. Obviously, you know, I keep saying the state championship. I think we all would like to win a state championship. That's that's the ultimate goal. Um, but what are some of the most memorable moments for you throughout your career? Well, even just the first time we won the section championship, that was that was huge. Um, I can remember the year that we won states when we when we won the section three championship, we were in the dome. That was a lot of fun playing in mm -hmm. the dome. They don't do it anymore, but that was, those were great, great times. And uh, I can remember that we had a penalty stroke against us. And my goalie, Jennifer Meyer, who had never seen a shot like this before, the girl that took the shot, put it into the upper left-hand corner. And my goalie just reached up and knocked. She made this incredible save that, I've never seen a kid make before and it was just phenomenal and it just excited everybody so much and it ended up, you know, determining the end of the game. Um, but uh, there's just, there's a lot, there's, there's so many, you know, even the tournament that we run the nighttime classic, that was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. We would do the, the, um, you know, month of October was breast cancer month. So we would do, things for that. Um, they wear pink shirts and pink socks and, you know, our booster club was great. We would have team shirts to at the beginning of the season to practice with. And, um, they always helped us have a really nice banquet at the end of the, at the end of the season. And that's where you get to just brag about all the kids and, you know, yep. tell them how, how great they were and how much you're looking forward to the next season, you know, just catch your breath and okay, now let's think about next year. But Coach, a, would lot you of, have, a lot of good times. Would you have done anything different throughout your 30 years of coaching? If you could go I, back? It, you know, uh, there's things I would have done differently, definitely. Um, you know, there's there's some interactions with kids that I would have handled in a different way. Um, thinking about all that now, it's like, you know, sometimes you just kind of react to what's going on. And as I've matured and grown, I've learned a lot of things, too, about about how to approach kids and and how to talk to them and it hasn't 
hasn't all been wonderful <laughs> as far as interactions. You know, I'm sure there's yep. there's a handful of kids out there that would tell you that, ah, oh, no, coach was too hard on me, you know, but you you just you learn and you hope that you just don't make the same mistake twice. And coach, you're you're involved with the the women in sports. Uh, we were talking uh, prior a little bit about that. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that and how that arrived? And um, I know you mentioned Ruth Demur. I think it's what the Breakfast of Champions it was called. Right, right. We call it the the Hall of Fame. We call it the Ruth Demur's National Girls and Women in Sport Breakfast of Champions. Long name. Um, but the National Girls and Women in Sport is is a national um, event that's run annually, and um, usually it's the first Friday in February every year. Although we've never done our breakfast in um, during the week on a Friday, we try to go with Saturday mornings, and we usually always go to Delta Lake Inn. They've been wonderful, and. Uh, so this year we're kind of, we've done it for three years. This is our fourth year and we've kind of gone back and forth. Okay, how do we do this with the pandemic? How can we continue this? And as a matter of fact, we were talking a little bit ago and earlier today, we now have a speaker. It's going to be Gloria Coleman Purcell, who was uh, an outstanding athlete, basketball and track athlete back in the 70s, I believe. Um, so we're trying to work out some details to to bring her through you, Rocky, um, to bring her on here and uh, maybe try to do, maybe try to do uh, something on the rock pile or something here. So hoping to keep c continuing to promote this. Yeah, no, absolutely. And coach, I was looking at some past speakers you had for that and coach Kiefer was one of them and Aaron Hamlin was one. And then Jess Jekko uh, was yep. another one. So great, great group of speakers. Yeah, it's been, it's been fun. It's been fun. And uh, we were very fortunate to get Aaron Hamlin as our first speaker, because that was that was literally a last minute finalization <laughs> for that breakfast. It took a lot of preparation because she was so busy; she was still competing, and uh, so it uh, it was amazing. And that kind of started us out. And everybody says, "Oh, where are you going to go from here?" Now that you started with her, you know nobody else is going to hold a candle to her, but. I beg to differ that uh, Jess Jekko did a great job. Nikki Kiefer did a great job. I know Gloria will do a great job. It's just to promote girls and women in sport and just, you know, teach these girls that there's so many opportunities out there, but you can't sit back and let other people make those decisions for you. If you want to be involved in something, just throw your, put yourself in there, you know? So. Well, coach, listen, I want to appreciate, and I appreciate you coming on here tonight. I thank you. And, all the field hockey I've watched, I still don't understand all the whistles, <laughs> but I've, I've learned it over the years, and uh, I, I've grown up with it my entire life. I love the game myself. I love following it, and uh, I, I've, I enjoyed watching you, Coach. You've always been good to me, and you've been good to my family, so I appreciate you, and we'll definitely keep in touch um, on the other thing for you, the women in sports. I'm more than happy to do it. Awesome. That's great, Rocky. Thank you very much. Appreciate you, Coach. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks for asking. It's You're been welcome. Fun. So that was awesome. Um, I know it looked like there were some technical difficulties. I, uh, it was not on my end or coach's end. I'm not sure um, if it was with the program I used, but I still had the interview going. I will make sure I get the edits up. I'll post it so everybody can see it. I want to thank Coach Harjung. She was fantastic. And like I said, I've, I have watched a lot of field hockey in my days from my sister played. Um, played in college, and then uh, even with my sister coaching here at Camden, I watched it for the last, oh, I'd probably say 30-something years, and I still don't understand all the whistles, but I love the game. I love following it. So thank you, Coach. I appreciate it. Next week's special guest is not only Coach Paul Lady, but it's my Uncle Paul Lady. Uh, I'm excited to talk to him. I'll be talking to Coach Jimmy Kenny this month, Coach Bill Fleet, Coach Jerry Fiorini. So the Rock Pile Legends continues for the month of March. Um, so just make sure you give me a follow on YouTube and you give me a follow on Facebook. Make sure to hit subscribe on my YouTube channel and never miss any of the shows that appear on Wednesday nights. So I appreciate everybody tuning in tonight. As I always say on Wednesday nights, the rock pile is where dreams become reality. Have a good evening, everybody.